We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com where click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best ways for questions to get to us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It's the last Wednesday of the month, and that means it's time for our end of the month AMA. Tonight, we're all about asking your, answering your questions live. I'll ask, yep. you'll answer. So, <laughs> yeah, I was asking you questions. There's a totally, we'll, we'll, we'll mix that up one month, I think. We'll, we'll ask our chat room questions. We should do that one. That, that'd be an interesting twist on the AMA. It's it's we ask you anything. Anyway, so here's your chance. Chat room, ask us anything you want, and we will answer you to the best of our knowledge. So, Ken Johnson asks, what do you use the bell for? All right, thanks for the question, Ken. This is the question I get asked the most often all over the place, on Instagram, on social media, when I share pictures online, but even when I show up in person with the bell with me and people show up to the local game store, or even I brought it with me when I went to Origins, and I was doing demos, I'd be like, do you mind? I'm going to put this on the table. Now, the bell exists for one simple reason, and that's branding. That's my bellhop call bell. It's a calling card. I try to make sure there's a bell in every picture I take, and I even bring it with me when I go gaming away from home. Like I said, I actually go went to Origins, and like while doing a demo for the game, I'm like, do you mind? And I put the bell on the table, then snap a picture. I personally think if people start thinking me as that guy with the bell, I'm doing something right. Absolutely. So uh, what do we have from the lobby tonight? What are people looking to know from the bellhop? Quiet night tonight. Uh, There's lots uh, of people talking. They're just not know. asking questions. Just talking about coffee and, and owning coffee mugs. Yes. Uh, so I'll dip into something from Emmett O'Brien, who asks, what are your rules for beverages on game night? I have banned blue soda from my <laughs> games because for some mystical reason, blue soda always gets knocked over. Blue soda? Do we even have blue soda here? Well, you, that, used to, that... you used to, didn't you used to do Chaos Pop with blue, with one of the blue drinks? From, I don't remember uh, blue. Meyer? I remember red. Like, a, a, not my, uh, what is it? Fago. Fago have a blue? I'm sure Fago has a blue. Fago they, they has all the blue. colors. Yeah, it's true. Jones Soda at least has a blue. I find it amusing that it's just blue only. Um, basic oh, yes, rule for beverages. Blue. Yeah, there you go. Basic rule for beverages is not on the table. We use TV trays or I don't know what it was, side tables, folding tables that you put out. Uh, they're actually lower than the main table, not higher because then stuff could still technically pull on. We put them in the corners of the table and we try to ask people to not have their beverages on the table. Now, I admit, sometimes we mess this up. <laughs> we try to do that, and we forget, and we put them on top, and we sometimes put the stuff right on the table. But the, the goal is to have no beverages actually on the game table where the components are. We're pretty good about it. We're not great. Where I'm really bad about it is at public play events. As I noticed last time, we were at CG Realm, and I spilled my coffee all over everything. So even then, I try to put it onto um, a chair or... a side table um what we often do if we do get food at the cg realm at the windsor sandwich shop we have it delivered like the whoever's cooked it brings it out we'll put it on a different table than where we're playing at and then when people are eating they'll move over to that table to take bites or to eat or they'll just eat between games because we've talked about that in one previous episode i couldn't tell you how long ago now where we talked about uh i personally prefer to pause gaming to eat and then resume gaming not eat while gaming yeah, I know uh, the last time last time I was at the CG Realm, uh, when you spilled the coffee and we had to dive to re recover, yep. um, a lot of times what I was doing, uh, well, depending on the game, if you've got a game where it's turn-based and there's a, you know, a little bit of thinking time, I will like run over and grab a bite, you know, or, or lean over and yep. grab a bite at a different table uh, between, uh, but also that depends on whether you're not you're eating something messy or not, right? Yep. You don't want to be eating wings and have to clean your fingers every 30 seconds to move a piece or something. Uh, yeah. luckily, uh, the hot dogs there aren't generally that messy. Well, the Coney dogs can be. <laughs> they, can, they can be. They can be. Yes. Um, so then, uh, Deanna just reminded me of something. Easy mode's great for this. They yes. have these little metal t t t tray tables that actually, they had them there the first time we went. And I was the one that was like, hey, can we steal some of those from, because they had them in the back by the, like, uh, for, by the TVs. 
right near Mario Kart or wherever they'd be playing. I'm like, can I steal these and bring these up front? Because one of the things is alcohol is served there. And beer is horrible for board games. Beer, I, I think beer may be as bad as, if not worse than Blue Pop. Uh, especially if you're getting, uh, drinking, the most popular beer there is a, a rather thick milk stout. And I don't want that on any of my game pieces ever, please. So they have these little metal tables that they'll put beside the table. So they work great. Right. Yeah, no, the, ta the tables there are nice because they, and they really are a good height too. Yeah. Um, so. And they're nice down low. Like even if you spill them, you're probably not going to get it on yourself or anything. So one of the problems I'm having is without be able to see you i have no visual cues if you actually want to say anything uh so i was just sharing some uh some blue moon mist fago in the chat room there there there's a moon mist there's blue. a blue moon mist berry and a fago cotton candy that are both blue All sodas. Right. they both sound terrible yeah well <laughs> i i have a feeling that the blue soda would not go well with my digestive problems i can't drink fago red pop anymore for that problem that reason I don't know. The only thing I suggest is try to share your screen and come back. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, maybe it maybe it'll help. Um, hey, Daniel, ask us a question, Daniel, or have Owen ask us a question. I've got a question for Owen. Can I, can I, can we reverse it around? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know when he signed up at Breakout Con last year to do the eighteen XX thing. And there's like an intro to 18xx. I know you were in there for six hours. Were you playing the same game that whole six hours? Because I want to know it's it's scheduled for a three hour window. If I can actually go in, learn to play an 18xx only in that three hour window. Yes, yeah, and I then don't believe it. Go do something else. I don't believe that it will be in three hours I, unless you walk out mid game. <laughs> like I, I don't I don't want to walk out mid game, but I will. Like if the slot says three hours and I plan something for that third hour to do something else i'm gonna to have to leave for those not familiar 18xx are a significant investment ah, game. see single game for the six hours see yeah even though it's a it says three hour window i was i was really hoping that maybe he did the intro and then went on to play another 18xx well i mean they do have that room that is the 18xx room so yeah. you know they're able to do whatever they want in that room essentially oh wow so, okay yeah that's unfortunate Oh, well, I was hoping. I am looking to, uh, I will probably be doing some demos of Gorinto at Breakout Con for anyone who's there. So uh, we have a question here from uh, Evil John, one of our patrons. Yes. Legacy games. Welcome serialized gameplay or overlong commitment that locks you out of other experiences. <laughs> That's a good way to word it. I like the way John worded that. Um... I personally really like legacy games, but not for either of those reasons. What I love about legacy games, and this could be any legacy game, one that doesn't require a campaign or an overly long commitment, is the permanency of your actions. And that is why any legacy game I play, I am going to destroy components. I'm going to rip up cards. I'm going to put down stickers. I'm going to write on the board. I'm not going to buy reusable stickers. I'm not going to sleeve everything. I am going to destroy that game as I play it because I love the fact that your actions have consequences in the game. That if I'm playing Seafall and I go to this island and I explore and there's some natives there and I decide to kill them, I'm going to mark the board that I killed them so that later bad things are going to happen to me for killing them. And that's a permanent thing that has happened in my game. And from then on, no one else can go to that place and get silk because I killed the natives that made the silk. But I get a constant supply of silk for the rest of the campaign. That's, that's, that is why I love legacy games. I love that impact that your actions have on the game. A good legacy game. Um, as for serialized gameplay... I don't know. It's the same as any other campaign game. I don't think it's any different than, say, playing an Imperial Assault campaign or playing Descent 2.0 or uh, I'm trying to think of good campaign games off the top of my head. We have an entire episode on good campaign games. Uh, not Paragon. <laughs> wow. My brain just completely went okay. away, too. <laughs> You're um, having that problem, too. All right. But yeah, I don't. I personally don't. Risk I Legacy. Do... Risk Legacy, yeah. Uh, pandemic Risk... Legacy. Uh, yeah, those do require full groups. So in a way, I, the overlong commit that locks you out of other experiences, I do have to say that is a thing. Um, actually, I think it's one of the questions that's in our chat room that, that if we get to it is, uh, did we put that one in there or not? 
is what will the group do once you finish Gloomhaven? I don't see it in our show notes, but I know it was a question we got in uh, the Slack room. And one of the things is, is all this other stuff I really want to try. Like, especially Clank Legacy looks fantastic, right? But we're still playing Gloomhaven. And right now, Gloomhaven's still fun. If it ever gets to the point, though it's not, we'll stop. Um, same thing with Risk Legacy. Risk Legacy, I never finished. Uh, that was due to the fact that the game group we had, one of the players, uh, I don't know how to word it, life situation changed. Uh, their, their work schedule, they finished school, got a job as a nurse. They had to deal with their, their significant other that that she would stay at home until he got his degree and then he would stay at home or whatever. It was He was staying at home until he got his degree and then she was going to stop working and he was going to start or something. But whatever it was, you it, it's done, right? Like they they he was no longer available. Um, so that's just definitely it. So we, we still have fun playing Gloomhaven, so we're probably going to keep playing it. But we did give up on Risk Legacy. Pandemic Legacy was tons of fun. Like, we played through the whole thing, and I hate Pandemic. And Pandemic Legacy, we wanted to play the next week, and we wanted to get done early so we could fit two night games in one night because that, that was the goal, was try to get in two games in one night. And I don't know. It's, it's, it's a commitment, but it's not. Like, Gloomhaven's different. Gloomhaven's, like, you're, you're looking at 100 games before you finish. Like, it's crazy. And then you could still go back and keep playing. It's almost a lifestyle game in that way. But most campaign games like that, most legacy games, are like 10 to 12 games. And that's not that big a deal, I don't think. Like, committing to play one game. I played Terraforming Mars way more than 12 games, and it's not serialized. All right. So uh, we got a question from Ryan. Thoughts on uh, Final uh, FFG's policy change on replacement components and their uh, discontinuing of RPG game development. So there's really two questions there. But Yeah, it's two questions. So Asmodee, it's actually Asmodee's policy. Asmodee is a publicly traded company. And as a publicly trading company, they are beholden to their stockholders. And their stockholders looked at a balance sheet and went, we are spending way too much money on replacement components for our games. So what they have decided is we're not going to replace components anymore. So if you buy an Asmodee game, and Asmodee owns almost all the major publishers, so Fancy Flight Games, Plaid Hat Games, like, to be honest, Sean could probably pull up a list while I'm talking yeah, here. Fantasy but they Flight, own... Days of Wonder, uh, Gigamic, Timon, Aiello, uh, Lillibud, Hasbro. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't own Hasbro. Oh, no, sorry. Hasbro should be on there. <laughs> that's, that's a different company. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a huge chunk of the board game industry is owned by them and they're no longer replacing components what they want you to do is go back to your retail location and return the game and then the retail store is supposed to do that i don't know i haven't talked to the local store owners but i can't see them being happy about this i know as a purchaser of games i'm not happy about this i've often gotten replacement components i it's there are people involved there are humans involved in putting these games together and mistakes get made it's going to happen. You're going to get a miniature missing an arm. You're going to get doubles of a punch board. You're going to be missing cards. That kind of stuff happens. And I personally think that that's part of the cost of doing business as a game board game publisher, that they should replace them. Uh, so I, I think it's a terrible decision. They're going to lose a lot of fans. But it's possible that Asmodee is now big enough they can't fail. That they, they, they own enough market share. Fantasy Flight's popular enough. It's it's just like every time someone calls for a boycott of Games Workshop, they keep trugging on, and the fans are still fans, and the fans keep buying. So I, I overall, people are pissed off. I'm not happy about it. I think it's a terrible business decision. They're gonna lose some market share over this. People are the the pissed off people aren't gonna buy the games. Uh, what we're waiting to see is a really big blow up, right? Like, are, are you gonna have like an automotive recall notice when like every copy of a game is missing something? Like, what do they do then? Well, Whereas before, go ahead. So the problem I see is, and I saw this really, uh, really well framed up, and, I, and unfortunately it was quite a while ago now, so I don't remember who on Twitter. But uh, this person asked their wife and said, who wasn't a gamer, and said, yeah. so if you buy something from the store and it's not complete, what do you do? And their immediate response was, I bring it back to the I bring store. It to the store. Uh, in general, products you purchase, you bring back to the store unless they are that special kind of pro uh, product, which has the big notice when you open up the box saying, in case of flaws, do not bring this back to the store True. because they have a service depot. And that's usually in, in general purchasing, 
you have the companies that have service depots like your Maytags and all things like that, or you have things that bring back to the store. Uh, and that normally, and again, this is, you know, outside of the, the board game resale market, stores will generally have supplies. And so you bring it back. It's wrong. They give you another one off the shelf, take the old one back, and they deal with the returns to the company. The problem that we're seeing here, and the reason why I think this is a bigger problem, is the, the fact that board games are a small purchase. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, these board game stores aren't keeping enough stock to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm right. I go buy the game from whatever local game store and I bring it home and it's missing a component. I go back and I'm like, can I replace this? And it's wingspan. Right. And I'm, they're like, oh, sorry, we don't have any replacement copies. Oh, can you get one in? Oh, they're out of print right now. It's between print runs, right? Like you just don't have that, that economy of scale that you do with mass market products. No, and I, and I mean, I'm seeing complaints. I'm seeing problems with like people talking about uh, a lot of the like the final the Final Fantasy uh, Star Wars components. It's like, hey, I bought this and my miniature's broken, so I have to bring it back to the store, and eventually they'll get a new one in for me. Um. Yeah, I, I said I'm not happy about it. I, we'll see how it plays out. I I don't know. Like, are that many people complaining? Like, it's it's a pretty much an industry standard that companies do this, and it should be baked into their budgets. Right, like I don't think any other companies are going to start doing this. It's, like I said it's a board of directors that sat there, saw a number on a spreadsheet, and we're like, "Whoa, what the heck's this? Why are we doing this?" Probably with the same argument as the husband and wife going, "Well, no one else does that. Why are we allowing this?" Well, and it's it's interesting. And uh, Anshi Games is bringing up a good point in the chat room. You know, to get an additional piece, you're going to end up trashing an entire mm -hmm. game. And I think what needs to happen is they need to tighten up their manufacturing. Well, uh, there's that. And 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 if if this starts happening, you start seeing a lot of waste of because of bad product, bad packaging and things like that. Then that board is going to attack other ends of the uh, of the manufacturing problem. So see what if, if, what you, if they seen... see loss, you know, if loss is in their budget, that's going to be addressed. Now, what I've seen retailers say is send me an extra copy. So every time if I order a crate of 10 games, send me 11. And that 11th one, I'm going to open up for components for people who come in with broken bits, which I think makes sense. Yep. Right? That that way, you're you're not it's not trashed because you're going to bring it in and go, I'm missing this. They're not going to take the game back. They're going to give you that bit. Now, this is a part of it that I don't know all the details of. From what I understand, retailers are still going to be able to get replacement pieces from Asmodee. So right. it's going to be a matter of you go to the store and complain, and then the store gives you a new copy, and then to sell that copy that was returned, they then contact Asmodee to get the bit. But then they're selling an open game, so I don't, I don't know that side of it. I, I don't work at a local game store. I have friends that own a local game store, and I might be able to get some info about it, but it's not something I know I, I can, I have an answer for. Yeah. So um, I'm just looking at the FAQ from uh, Asmodee right now. Um, you know, I bought my game at a big box store. Return it to the uh, find follow their policies. Um, if you buy it from Asmodee, visit the web store and use the contact us. Uh, if you buy it secondhand, check before well, you buy. Buyer beware. Yeah, it was because uh, you're SOL for that. Yeah, there there are a lot of entitled gamers that seem to think that if their cat eats a piece, that the company should replace it. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I, if it comes defective from the manufacturer, the problem. And yes, there are a lot of publishers for years who have replaced cat eaten pieces, and I ripped yeah. the card and whatever, and it's awesome that they do, but you shouldn't expect it. Yeah, and one of the problems, and then there's the what they state on their FAQ, and it's a realistic problem is because of the size of Asmodee now, they have grown yeah. to a point where the ability to keep a warehouse full of all the potential components. I mean, that's insane. Uh, you know, if they were well, able to fair. get into a print-on-demand sort of thing, but the warehousing costs to well, keep how is it, fair components how is it of everything. Worse now? How is it worse now that they're a bigger company? All these individual companies used to do it. Well, I don't yeah. see how it's worse now that they're they're so big. That doesn't make sense to me. Oh, it does. It, it Because now it's a, it's a warehouse of spare parts rather than, you know, this little game company had, you know, the back room that they kept a bunch of stuff in and, you know. Yeah, but when they bought these places out, they 
literally just changed the ownership. They didn't close other stores. Like these little places still exist. Why wouldn't Plaid Hats still keep Plaid Hats pieces and indie boards and cards keep their stuff? And well, because Asmodee, as the as the parent company, is responsible. Yeah, but then they, they bought it. Yeah, I guess. But then they should just be able to tell uh, the company to send it. They're like, hey, Plaid Hat, you're missing a piece. Send it out. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. And, and, and again, we don't know all the yeah, contract contractual not. agreements between all the different parts. But, uh, but yeah, overall, uh, I, it's 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 definitely a new twist for the board game industry. We'll see if other publishers follow suit. I don't actually know. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I mean the the concept is. Um, it's going to be, and, and and she games is saying by that argument they don't have the ability to ship pieces to retailers, yeah. and I don't see any mention of them shipping pieces to retailers. So they may actually just be shipping extra games. Yes, yeah, I saw something about those pieces retailers but, being able to then recoup the cost, right? Because then the right. retailer can't is stuck with a broken game. There was some discussion on that on one of the the face private Facebook groups for yeah, industry insiders. For, for retailers, they specifically say, contact your sales rep directly, and they don't yeah, like, publish that, that information. Exactly. It's it's not published. So yeah. I have a bit of insider that there's a way to do it, but yeah. I don't know. It, it's a, it's, I think it's going to be a mess. Uh, like I said, where I think we'll see it blow up is when the expansion for Outer Rim, Star Wars Outer Rim, every copy is missing the X-Wing card, right? And then what do they do? Like, would you have a recall, like I said, in the auto industry, that we're going to burn all those copies and resend them out? Like, I don't know. It's And, and they say Asmodee's so big. It, Z-Man Games is Asmodee. Like, it's it's a huge portion of the market. Uh, well, I mean, and part of the problem, again, is the fact that we're just used to it, right? I mean, I remember back oh, in yeah. the 80s, you know, if you bought a copy of, you know, a Hasbro game and there was a missing piece, there was usually you a phone number you sellers. called. No, there was a phone number you called in the yeah. box. Um, and they would often mail you a part. Um, it has been part of the board game industry for mm. a very long time, for for better or worse. Um, I'm not, I don't really know if there's a a good or a bad. Uh, it is just that is the way that industry has been, and we're used to it. You and know what I would love to see is, some companies do this, is what they should be doing to counteract this is give you extras of stuff. So that if something is missing or something does break, you have extras. Now, some companies are great for this, right? Like uh, Eagle Griffin, I think, is one of the ones where, like, Lisboa, they gave you an extra copy of every token. Like, yeah, you can only lose one, but you can lose one and still play the game. Yep. Like an extra punch board, whatever. I think it would be great. Yep. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's 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 money. You know, we are in a... Well, yeah. You know, then especially now that we have, you know, thousands of games coming out, the market is swamped. Margins are becoming thinner because you're forced to compete against Kickstarter, where some people are probably losing their shirts to put out a game. Uh, Although Asmodee's not, math. Asmodee's not really competing with Kickstarter when most of their companies are publishing through Kickstarter. True, but I mean there are, but there are still other games being. Yes. I mean, you know, yes, Asmodee yeah. is a, is a is a huge part of it, but uh, yeah. the fact that they aren't all of it, and so the margins are still getting driven down. And I think yeah. Asmodee would like to try and change that. Um, yeah, overall, this is one of the big changes we're going to see in the industry. Is a lot less games coming out. We, the, it, I'm not going to say the bubble has burst because I don't know if I believe in the whole board game bubble theory in the first place. But we're not going to see another year where 9,000 games come out at once. That was two years ago. Last year was only 5,000. It's going to be even less this year. Uh, for example, Stefan Feld has said, I'm not putting out another game until next year. It's just the market is too flooded. No one can play all the games anymore. And great games are getting missed. Because there's just so much. There's just too much. It's like, and, and it's the same thing that's happened to other industries, right? Like, no one listens to all the music. No one watches all the movies. No one reads all the books. No one plays all the games anymore. It's it's yep. not going to happen. And we're never going to get to the point, again, where you probably can play all the games. But it should adjust to a more reasonable level in the next couple of years, I think. And and part of the problem, I think, is, um, you know, with, a TV, with TV shows and movies, you watch them once and move on. Whereas mm -hmm. board games are designed to be experiences that you re experience over and over again. So you you can have more TV shows and more movies and more books out there because you you can burn through them. Yep. Uh, whereas a game, you're not supposed to burn through that. You're supposed to yeah. say, you know, come back to it, maybe not every week, but over and over again. Not just but that isn't one the, and done. 
that is another change we've seen, though, is people designing games to be good for the one and done. Because some people do consume board games that way now. Yep. And designers realize that and publishers realize that. Well, and unfortunately, I, I have to say that a lot of the review market, and I'm just proudly saying not our review market, uh, <laughs> you know, we aren't pushing the hot new stuff. Uh, we're pushing, you know, whatever. Whatever and, I've been playing that's fun. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we're, we're pushing the fun games, not the newest games. Whereas some of these reviewers are always just craving that next new thing. Uh, you know, I see tw I saw Twitter blow up the other day about some of the new games coming from um, our favorite our favorite design studio. Yeah, um, and you know Prospero. the new Wonder Woman and you know all these new Prospero Hall games that aren't out yet and aren't going to be coming out yet, but the review copies are already out, so they're driving this market for something that isn't even going to be out for six months. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, troubling. And again, yeah, like Deanna is pointing out, we said this during our last episode where we talked about games from pre-2000. We're not saying new games aren't good. Yeah. <laughs> We're not saying that they're on a downward spiral and all new games are crap, but there are definitely some good old games as well. Yep. John, John's got another potential topic there for us. How perishable. No, that's a good one. Yeah. I, that, that's not a, that's not an AMA topic though. That's a yeah. that's an episode topic, I think. But to be honest, the, the industry is running that way. So when we had Daniel Zayas on the show, this is one of our early um, interview episodes. That was his belief: was that the board game industry, tabletop gaming, is becoming more like Hollywood, where you're going to go on out, you're going to try the game, you're going to enjoy the game, you're going to talk about the game, everyone's going to talk about the game, and then move on to the next one. The rare game you're going to want to bring home, and that is he expected a big change in the industry that way. And that ties into the popularity of things like board game cafes, which are popping up everywhere, where you don't need to own all the games. You go to the board game cafe, you try Wingspan, you're like, wow, Wingspan was a lot of fun. If you really liked it, you buy the DVD and bring it home, right? The same way people consume movies. If you don't really like it, maybe you go back to the theater and see it again. You go back to the game store or you go back to the co coffee shop or whatever it is, the board game cafe, and you play Wingspan three months from now with your significant other again, and then you leave. And you don't feel bad for not owning Wingspan. You can always go play it at that place later, yeah. no, which I, think, I, I can I, see. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, I think we're, we're moving quickly to that if and only if the board game cafe market manages to stay strong. Um, yeah. And now I think that's going to require some things. I think that's going to require some FLGSs sort of pivoting a little bit into more of a cafe uh, situation where they can provide that, that sort of experience where you can play at the FLGS and buy. Uh, otherwise they may end up running into competition from the cafes where maybe you don't go for a game maybe you're just there for it because it's good food yeah. um or you can do the, go there for the game um and have some coffee you need to sort of uh balance that and, and depending on the market is whether or not the flgs's are going to feel the pressure from the cafes or not i think is a lot of it the problem with that is as a local game store, you need to start charging people to play your games for that to be viable. And as a local game store, you probably never have charged people to play your demo games. So that's a culture change, right? That's getting people to start paying to use the tables in stores you never had to pay before if they're going to compete with a cafe. Well, yes and no, because there are other ways. I mean, you look at stuff, you, you look at, uh, you know, and again, I'm going to use the CG Realm, for example, you know, they've got the restaurant component. So if they can bring you in for free and, and hook you on, you know, the secondary charges, you know, that's, that's what yeah. they need to work on is you don't, because they're an FLGS, they, maybe they don't charge for the table, but they find other ways to upsell basically uh, yeah. and, and help cover the cost. I think it'd be difficult because not every game cafe that I've ever seen that I've been in does charge. So like for playing the games in some way or right. another, like I, we got dinged with that the first time we went to a local Windsor one where we brought our own game and they wanted to charge us to play our game. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I will just walk down the street and go play for free. Thanks. Cause I'm used to being able to play for free, especially if I, I can see if I'm going to use your game, I might want to pay, but if I'm bringing my own, but yeah. that's part of that, industry right that's yeah. that's part of the thing interesting side note that i did not know until today snakes and lattes is a publicly traded company i had no clue you can buy yeah. stock in snakes and latte yeah they're uh they're a big deal they just changed their name to f-u-n-n -N is their stock market oh, really i don't yeah i don't know which market they're on probably toronto i would assume but 
interesting. Yeah, I um, did not know that. So let's just jump back into Ryan's question again. We'll get back into uh, into Asmo D. Uh, what about the eventual discontinuing uh, of RPG game development for FFG? Uh, you know what? That one I almost don't want to comment on because there's just all these unsubstantiated rumors right now. So supposedly someone put out an article saying they like first they they did fire their development team. But that doesn't mean anything in the RPG industry because almost every company nowadays uses freelancers. Like Wizards of the Coast, the last time I looked it up, had eight employees. That's it. Like, it's crazy how small these companies... Like, the company that makes D&D, right, is like eight employees because they contract everything. They don't need employees that work for them. They just need contractors to write stuff. And from what I could tell, Fantasy Flight got rid of the development team because they were switching to this model. Now, recently, in the last week or so, someone put out an article, and I can't remember who it was. It was one of the bigger online media sources for Geek News, that the games were dead. No more Genesis, no more Star Wars, no more Tyranoth, and whatever RPG series are all dead. But then I saw a counter article that said that was not true, that someone was just extrapolating some news that wasn't necessarily true, right? Like, the, the, they aren't killing it. So I don't actually know if they're killing RPG game development or if they're outsourcing it. And I don't really want to comment because I don't know what the actual answer is. All I can say is I really like their games. Like I, I love that narrative dice system and I, I dig the work they've done. And I think it kind of stinks that they may be stopping, but I can see why like fantasy flights, a, a board game company. And again, they're owned by Asmodee, which is a publicly traded company. And someone's probably looking at profit margins and going, what's with the star Wars RPG compared to X wing. Cause X wings are big money maker. The prince, the money and they're looking at X wing figures and they're looking at star Wars edge of the empire figures going, these don't balance out. Why are we doing this second thing? So it, if they're killing it, it sucks. Uh, they're good games, but to be honest, they put out content in my opinion, way too quickly. I can't keep up with the games. Even when I had a very well-paying job, I couldn't keep up with the schedule from flight. What I would love to see is them just cutting back, keeping the games and putting out whatever, two to four modules a year, two to four flat books, just enough to keep the game going and keep it interesting for people who are are keeping up. But none of the like flat book every month and a deck of cards every other month and new maps every month. Like it's just, it's way too much to keep track of. So uh, I'm looking at a statement from Fantasy Flight Games right now. Um, they declined commenting on the Final Fantasy Interactive shutdown or the layoffs, but did confirm that all four of the announced RPG products uh, are continuing and that all three product lines are ongoing. See, that's what I thought. That's the that's what I had seen, but I didn't want to say it officially. Yeah, so so that, that is directly some off news their... media. Yeah, some news media site ran with the fact that they did get rid of their development team. That is true. They laid off their development team. But that doesn't mean anything in the RPG industry. Very few RPG companies have in-house writers nowadays. Yeah, no, it's going to be freelance, which I have to say is another problem um, because uh, the gig economy is not sustainable in the long term. Uh, we have Kickstarter employees now unionizing. Uh, one Ooh. of the food delivery services in Toronto has just won a court case allowing uh, unionization of their delivery employees. Um, the gig economy is in trouble, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, yeah. It's going to mean a lot of changes. It's going to mean a restructuring of how we think things cost because prices are going to go up. But what you're going to get for that and what employees are going to get for that, I think is probably going to win out in the end. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, Jeff uh, has asked us, what do you think print or do you think print and play games will take off more than they have if we're moving towards that perishable game concept? I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know what it is, but people just have an aversion to print and play games. They, they want physical, they want something, they want to have it in their hands. Uh, there's definitely... Uh, a subset of gamers who are all about it, all about cheap gaming, print and play, um, and all that. But I think overall, I don't know. I don't think print and play is really ever going to take off. I, possibly, like I know some people do it. But well, you don't. Um, you are not a, a print and play. Lover. No, 
at all. No, I'm not. I don't, <laughs> I don't. I can't explain it. It's the same reason I, I hate reading PDFs. I want a physical book. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know why. But no, I'm not a big fan. But I think it's even worse in a way. Like a print and play game. If I'm only going to play once, I don't want to waste the time to put it together. Right. Like depending on the game, if you're talking about an RPG, it's probably print a PDF or download a PDF. But if I'm doing a print and play board game and there are lots out of there, I'm printing boards and I'm mounting things and I'm grabbing chips and chits from other games and I'm finding my dice and I'm putting it all together. And I'm probably spending way more time putting everything together than I am going to be playing it. And if I only play that once, that's going to be terrible. I'm like, man, I wasted all this time to only play this game once. Uh, Like I said, I I, I don't think so. I I like, I don't know. I like physical things. It's, It's I'm sure it's a culture thing. It's how I grew up. I, I have, it feels ephemeral if I don't have that thing in my hand. And like Neil, my friend Neil is all about print and playing stuff for his games. Like he will sit there. If he'll he'll try to buy a game. Like he will do his his dand- darndest to get this game some Chinese developer made that plays seven players and seven players only. And it's supposed to be amazing and recreate some period of time that I have nothing know nothing about. And if he can't get the company to send him a copy, he'll sit there and literally build the game himself he'll go online and he'll screenshot the the board and he'll print it off and he'll mount it and it'll look amazing that's how i played wallenstein the first time was basically like this print and play copy that he had cuddled together from all these different german components that's what he loves but we played that way more than once and the games he spends the time doing on he's playing like 30 40 50 times because that's how he consumes games and I, i've talked about neil before he has a gaming library of about five games and that's it and he rotates them out they play those same five games all the time every saturday two to six games a night on saturdays and then they get sick of it and he sells it and he gets a new game and then they play that game for so long it's a very different way to do it. It's not the um, perishable gaming at all. No, no. They play the heck out of a game. Oh, yeah. They they use their games up. <laughs> oh, they do. They really do. And they do every little expansion, every house rule. They try every variant. They get the game designer on the phone while they're playing. Like, they took take it very seriously. Which is, probably, in a way, kind of cool. It's just very different than how I consume games. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, Ryan, Ryan does point out there is there is a potential that some places where shipping is just ridiculous. Maybe yeah. print and play becomes more reasonable. Like I know a lot of things shipping to, uh, you know, the Pacific Australia. Rim going down to Australia and stuff like that. They pay through the nose for shipping yeah. a lot of times, depending on how the company arranges shipping. Uh, and so maybe for them, if they're going to spend 45 bucks on shipping a $40 game, maybe printing it out and spending an hour or two is worth it. Yeah. No, very true. Very true. I could see that. So I'm going to grab the question we had from our Discord, if I can find it here. Where is... Oh, I don't have our Discord open. Uh, I think it came from Math Guy Dave, who asked, what is your plans for the Gloomhaven group when you're done? I'm paraphrasing, because I don't... I thought it I had is, Discord uh, open. What's next for Friday Night Group after Gloomhaven? All right. For one, at this rate, we started in September 2018. I, it doesn't feel like Gloomhaven's ever going to end. So I, I, I think that's... We'll just be playing that forever. Uh, I really do. It's it's feeling like that. Uh, maybe we should rush and try to get to the uh, the end of Gloomhaven because yes, I saw Evil Jayon in the chat noted that he didn't know you could finish it. Technically, you can. You can finish the story. There is an end. There is an overarching plot that you can complete. There is an expansion out that adds more to that plot, um, and then it's done. After that expansion, Gloomhaven is done. Uh, this year soon, uh, the preview is up right now on Kickstarter. You can look at Frosthaven, which is the next big Gloomhaven game from Isaac Childress um, and Cephala Fair Games. It's there. Um, but I think if we do finish it, I'm going to take a break from Gloomhaven. I really would like to, we'll probably stick with that group because this group actually started as a pandemic legacy group, like right? playing with Tori and Kat started off with me buying a copy of Pandemic Legacy and trying to find a group to play through that campaign. And started with the most we will play is 24 games. The average game is probably about 16 to 18. And they're like, sure, we'll sign up. And this is before we live streamed or anything like that. So I, I have a feeling that group will always be a legacy group. We'll play something campaign. Personally, right now, I would like to play Clank Legacy. Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated looks fantastic. I love deck builders. I love Clank. I first shied away from it because I know nothing about um, Acquisitions Incorporated. 
Like, I know it's a comic book from Penny Arcade, and it somehow commercializes D&D in your adventuring party, which actually sounds like something I used to do in a D&D second edition years ago. It sounds very much like the Obsidian Fist now that I've dug into it a bit more. And I don't like the art style, but so I kind of shied away from it, but I've heard so many good reviews that it's just Clank where you have an evolving master deck and your personal deck evolves and you're putting stuff on the map. Like, it looks really good. So um, Clank Legacy is probably the one I would like to move to. But, like, right now, that's the hot game. By the time we actually finish Gloomhaven, who knows what the, the hot Legacy game will be. Part of me wants to play Pandemic Legacy Season 2 just for a sense of completeness. But I've heard it wasn't as good as 1. And while 1 was pretty good, we um, it ended badly. Like, our personal campaign ended on a sour note. And I've heard it's not as good. And I'm like, well, if it's worse than that, do I really want to play pandemic legacy season two yeah no i pandemic Le- legacy just left a very sour taste in your guys mouth with the uh, the way the oh, way just... it all sort of played out and 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 choice the way the way choices were kind of made and 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 disappointing i don't want to spoil anything obviously uh for anyone who does enjoy yeah. it but uh yeah it's interesting Oh, there you go. Evil John Lake Pandemic Season 2 better. I don't know. I, there, there's just other stuff since then that's come out. Yep. So I don't I don't know if we do that. I um, really want to go buy another copy of Risk Legacy and play through that because we didn't finish the first time. But I don't think it'd be with that group. I think I'd find a new group to play it. Uh, Angie Games is saying Lord of the Rings. <laughs> or uh, the, the problem is Tori and Kat are already playing it. That's so true, they're yeah. not going to play it with us. They've already got a campaign of that going. But yeah, I want to play Lord of the Rings Journeys in the Dark, but that'd be a different group. Yes, and Deanna wants to play Seafall, but I, th- I think we need to buy another copy of Seafall and start over with a different group. Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> the, yeah, the new... Uh, uh, Ryan points out there's the new uh, Scooby-Doo Mystery Mansion Betrayal at the House on the Hill retheme. Thoughts? I- I hate Betrayal at House on the Hill, so I'm not going to pick up a Scooby-Doo version or a D&D version or a sci-fi version or anything else that says Betrayal at Ho- at Betrayal Legacy. You know what? To be honest, Betrayal Legacy, I've heard some good things on that. Slightly tempting. But again, I like Legacy games. I like that permanent. So uh, that slightly appeals. But I have not. I have had really, really bad experiences with Betrayal at House on the Hill. And the bad experiences outweigh the good ones. So it's, it's the opposite of fallout i've talked about before right. how like 25 percent of games of fallout it's like someone has no chance of winning but the good ones the good the other 75 percent are so much fun that i'll still play the game where betrayal is like the other way around like 75 percent of the time the game was bad and the 25 percent of the time when it was good didn't make up for those bad experiences right. and just sitting down to play knowing that i could have one of those bad experiences i don't even want to take the chance Uh, we got some people in there. We've got ten more sessions for betrayal. Uh, we've got folks who uh, who finished betrayal. Um, so I've heard betrayal legacy is better. I don't know. So yeah, no, it's hard to say. Angie Games was enjoying Seafall, but I think we've talked in the past about uh, the issues that caused that uh, that to end. Yeah, the our problem with Seafall was nothing wrong with the game. Yeah, it's it was... it's is a very unique game. And you have to be willing to do kind of the same things over and over again. Because every game you basically start from scratch, which is kind of weird in a legacy game. And yes, you get little minor improvements, but it's like, oh, I'm going out to go to the islands again. And I'm going to go do the thing again. And I'm going to deliver this good again. And then I'm going to get my engine going. And then maybe we'll unlock something new. And then it'll add a little bit more. Like, it's, it's, it's a very unique game. The problem we had was one of the players was falling behind. And despite the fact that we tried to assure them that there's different parts of the game, and there's, I guess there's like, here the slight spoilers, there's like three chapters of the game, and different strategies work better in different chapters, and there's a catch-up mechanic, and everything I've read online is like, if you're falling behind in the first part, don't worry, but he wasn't willing to go that right. far, so... Uh, there we go. Uh, Brian wants to know, would you convert the Gloomhaven group to a full RPG group? No, no, that's a board game group. Like I said, we play legacy games. Not that I'm adverse to playing RPGs with Tori and Cap, but Friday night wouldn't be. No, I, I should, I technically have an RPG group that gets together on Mondays sometimes. And, sometimes. you know, once in a while. In the last three years, I think we've got together once. Um, no, hey, you we made your DCC characters. We did. We made DCC characters. 
that we we didn't play Monday, but that was partly my fault. Um, like I think role playing with Cat and Tori would be great, but that group's a group that we play legacy games, and I think we'll keep doing that on Friday nights. Like that that particular group, it's working, right? Yeah. Like, put it this way, Deanna hates co-op games, and we've had her playing a co-op game since 2017, <laughs> every Friday, pretty much, right? Like, we even had her play Betrayal, or, uh, Big Trouble in Little China one week. So, And you got her having I fun don't... playing Medium. Yes, yes. But, like, I, I don't know, that group just gels. Like, we, I, I even got her to say the game is a pretty good game once, which is a pure co-op. So I don't think so. I don't think that group will ever jump over to RPGs, though I hear about Tori and Kat talking about their D&D sessions, and I kind of like, oh, God, you should play under me sometime. But, like, maybe if I got a group going, I'd, be, I'd invite them to join <laughs> at some point. Uh, uh, what have we got here? Uh, have you ever played any of the collector card games? The collector? Are you talking like Magic the Gathering? Is that what we're looking at, collectible card games? If that is the question, then back in the <laughs> 90s, I think I played all of them at least once. That was at least my goal. Uh, at that time in my life, I had disposable income from a unique source. I was selling off my old toys, and I was selling them to a place in Detroit called the Classic Comic and Movie Center that was giving me book prices for uh, Star Wars and Transformers. And I was converting that into store credit. And by converting it into store credit, I would buy whatever they had. So they had an RPG selection, so that's an awful lot of where my Vampire, because at that time period I was running Vampire the Masquerade for 17 players. Sean was even in that game. He played a Nosferatu called Info. Don't ask me why I remember that. I don't remember what Dean was playing, but <laughs> I remember your Nosferatu. Because I almost never played Nosferatu. I normally played Malkavs. Yeah, no, you were the Nosferatu, yeah. and you used to set it the, the wrestling video game. Yep. And play, yeah, no, play I, I, that. no I, yep. I remember. It was, that was my cyberpunk vampire character, basically. Yep. Yeah, you had the hacker. But yes, um, so I, I, that's where I got almost all my vampire books. Uh, that's also where I got a large collection of my novels, fantasy novels. I, at the time, I was into the uh, Thomas Covenant series. I can't remember what the, the tales of Thomas Covenant, that was where those came from. That's also when I started collecting spawn action figures because I was getting so much credit, I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, so I started buying all the CCGs. So I tried Heresy, I tried Mech Warrior, I tried Netrunner, I tried... Uh, Magic, of course. Magic we got into beforehand. Magic's got an interesting story. I don't know if I'm going to tell it now or not with Richard Garfield being in Windsor and me running Warhammer. Magic we got into previous to that. Um, Wyvern. Uh, the D&D &D dice game, whatever that was called. I'm drawing a blank on the name of that one. Wasn't it just Dungeon Dice? No, that doesn't sound right. Dragon Dice. Dragon, Dragon Dice, that's it. Yeah. So Dragon Dice. Uh, Spellfire. Star Wars, uh, the Star Wars where the one side was light side, one was the dark side. The Mo, the uh, Decipher Star Trek game. Um, I'm still Overpower, uh, Rage, uh, Arcadia: The Wild Hunt. Um, oh, like like all of them. Like like the uh, the BattleTech. Yes, BattleTech, the trading card game. I tried uh, Dune, although I only had two decks. The Knights of the Dinner Table trading card game, Illuminati. Um, Again, I'm, jeez. Like, basically, we, we tried all of them. Like, we tried every single possible CCG that came out in the time. Of all of them, Wing Commander, Galactic Empires. Galactic Empires is actually one of my favorites. I love Galactic Empires. My second favorite was Middle Earth, the Wizards. Uh, specifically, just the Wizards, not when you played the Minions or you played the Nazgul. Middle Earth was actually the best one, too. Yeah, like, yeah. welcome to the Mo Listing CCG show. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I played all the CCGs at some point. Magic the Gathering was was by far one of the best. Lord of the Rings, the Wizard, or Middle Earth, the Wizards, was, was probably second. The Decipher Star Wars was Deanna's favorite. I also enjoyed that one. And uh, Galactic Empires was one of my favorites. I really liked Galactic Empires, but no one else played it. Jihad is another one. I'm sure there's probably more. <laughs> uh, all right, moving on. Uh, thoughts about the new uh, version of Masquerade now by Modifius? I have not gone back to Vampire since those early days. The last time I ran Vampire was for that 17-player campaign. I haven't played it since. Um, I got to say, today's society, nowadays, Vampire seems a little more problematic. Um, I don't know if I would want to run games with some of those themes nowadays. 
if I did, it would definitely be, I'd, I'd have a very long session zero talking about what we wanted to do with the system, what we wanted to play out. Um, what we did with Vampire was never any of the shocks. Just like the, the, we didn't do a lot of horror when I ran Vampire. It was more politics. I did a lot of politics. I did a whole thing because you had Windsor and Detroit. I had that uh, Detroit was owned by the Sabat. Windsor was owned by the Camarilla. And the Sabat were trying to take over Windsor to, to own the border. Um, of course, because of where I live, the, the biggest threat was the werewolves of London. Because how do you not? Uh, <laughs> That was a big part of the game too. So it was more politics between the the, the Camarilla and the Sabat, and and a, uh, the werewolves of London being the external threat. So we didn't get into the human like like humanity was a stat on the sheet, right? It wasn't really part of our game. We didn't get into the horror of it. it and I don't know if that's something I'd want to get into nowadays. There is an awful lot of uh, people upset with the new edition and happy with the new edition. I don't know doesn't really appeal to me now though i'll still dig the music and i'll still go to goth clubs but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm no longer wearing the eyeshadow so i can't play vampire anymore yeah it's interesting it, it, i mean it looks like i'm just looking at the uh, modithius page it's their fifth edition and it looks like it's all the standard stuff chicago by night the camarilla handbook, well they brought and, it back yeah. so it, it had there was a new world of darkness where they had an end of the world and oh, they okay. rebooted everything and then people were kind of upset to get everyone back into it they they just rebooted with all these 20th anniversaries and stuff like that and the new editions bring it back to its roots so it's kind of back to where we started and so uh gaming and bs has, has joined us and uh, stated outright that mo does not own enough games oh i'm pretty sure i do <laughs> uh d is agreeing <laughs> with them but i don't know I, I am i am pretty sure i do i need to get rid of some games i'm not saying that i don't want some new games but <laughs> I, I own way too many games uh i definitely wore eyeshadow i had big stomping boots with buckles yep. i had a top hat uh, ass boots. i had i had hair that went halfway down my back and a ponytail and now i have almost no hair i yep. lost it all but to be honest different story the eyeshadow I only did like twice like two or three times maybe I, I didn't tend to go with the makeup. Yeah, no, I did. I don't wear black bracers and a leather uh, fencer's hat and stuff like that. Uh, and yes, Jeff, from what I can see, these are uh, a new version of the original stuff with the Anarch cookbook, Chicago by Night. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's the old vampire in in new form. Yeah, like I said, they're they're definitely trying to trying to bring back the old audience, yeah. and they do very doing. clearly have a mature content yes. warning at top yep. they, no question yeah it's it's definitely a very different yeah i just i i don't know i don't that playing in that world just doesn't i don't know uh, well, my brother my brother-in-law and my sister are playing in a weekly uh or in theory weekly uh vampire <laughs> game again so <laughs> in theory weekly yeah, there well, you go it. but but it's, it's definitely there yeah. We don't we don't see people LARPing Vampire Downtown anymore. But. No, no, the LARPing of Vampire has probably subsided some. I'm sure there are still groups out there. Oh, I'm sure there are. It was. Uh, uh, now that that is one aspect of gaming I still have zero experience with. Yeah, no, like, I, like, I'm not counting ska, but there's, like, a, that's there's I mean, I, I'm still interested in um, the big one they do at uh, Breakout. Um, the yeah, big, that one sounds cool. Though, that one the, sounds really interesting. I'm not I can't interested. Remember what it's yeah, I'm. I'm not interested in going out and and you know dressing up and swinging boffer swords. That doesn't really right. appeal to me. But uh, some of the the more interactive brain thinky uh, LARPs uh, that they do at cons do intrigue me. Yeah, yeah. There's the I can't remember what's called the breakout they do it. It's it's like a 18 hour, or 12 hour or something LARP, and it's uh, if aliens are invading the Earth. And it's like a huge, it's like whatever, 50 people and some are on the alien side and some are on the human side and you play out this whole system. It, it looks fascinating. I just don't want to lose an entire day at a con to play it. Yeah, well, that's the problem, right? It's, it's you know, we're, we're there to do so much. Yes. So. Especially we're there to work, right? So. Yeah. All right, uh, any other questions? So for those of you who joined the chat recently, I'd love to see the influx of new people. That's awesome. I see some new names in there and some names I know that I don't, haven't seen too often in the chat. We are doing an AMA, so if you have a question, feel free Absolutely. to ask. Yeah, okay. I see like Eric Laz. That's not a name I recognize. Right, it's yeah. awesome to see Brent and Sean in the chat again. And this is uh, both uh, RPG and 
and board games, card yeah, games, tabletop. obviously. <laughs> anything tabletop. We're good anything to talk tabletop. about. Yeah, Deanna really wants to try the um, Living Dungeon. They're, they're, from what I understand, it's it's a mix of dexterity games and, and uh, escape room type stuff with people in costume and stuff. It sounds really cool. I don't well, know. Well, I don't know. I, you said you said dexterity games, so I don't know. You might have just turned off ancient games. I don't know. No, I, I know uh, that at least one of, I know part of the the real dungeon or whatever it's called, there's like a shuffleboard thing and that's how the fighter attacks. Right. So I know there's some elements of it, but I don't know a lot. I've never done it. I yeah, know. I have to say, like, I, I've done some of the higher end uh, escape room stuff and they are, they're fun. And there is some dexterity. Um, there was one where we, you know, we actually had to walk across a beam. Nothing, nothing really yeah. happened if you fell off, but it was easier to get past the lasers if you walked across a, a padded beam. Um, yes, True Dungeon, Ryan asked. I couldn't remember the name. I was trying to say Living Dungeon, but True Dungeon, where you actually get like little tokens too. Like there's a whole token emo- economy. I don't know. It's it's weird where like people trade tokens and sell them on eBay and stuff. What I what turned me off on it was that it was a separate cost from your badge to play at Origin, like everything is. But it was a significant <laughs> cost separate. So uh, here we go. Uh, when you run an RPG, how yes. do you keep your GM notes electronically or by hand? That implies that I keep notes when I'm GM. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, by hand, still to this day. I, I, Well, I can type. If I could sit at a computer, I could do it. I can type really quick, but I cannot type quick on a tablet or a phone. i just terrible on them. So if I had, like, a laptop, I would possibly start using notes. But, no, I personally, I have a DM binder, and it's got typical, like, three-ring line sheets in it, and that's how I keep my notes. Um I definitely have always been pen and paper. That's actually how I make my notes when I prep too. I don't use I don't use anything digital. Uh, for a while, I was using oh I can't remember the name of the app. It's one that got discontinued on Apple, so I got screwed over actually because I paid for it and they discontinued it. Evernote, uh, Evernote that might yeah. be it. And what it could do is you could open multiple tabs of the same PDF. So I would have like the combat system opened and the say the drowning rules and I would have the 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 prices for horses and overland movement open because I knew that was the stuff that was gonna happen during that game. And you could annotate it, which was awesome. So I had like I could quickly bring up encumbrance rules, say, and I would annotate encumbrance rules and I could literally tap encumbrance and it would bring me to the page. So I tried that and it worked great for the one game I spent the time to do it on. But then shortly thereafter, I just went back to flipping through the book and trying to remember where stuff was and putting post-it notes in my hardcover books. <laughs> and all it was was it was uh, Marvel superheroes is actually what I was running at the time. Yeah, I know I said encumbrance and stuff. It doesn't have that, but you get the point. Um, so I was running a Marvel heroic role playing from Margaret Weiss because I had the PDF that Cam Banks sent me. So I had annotated it on. It was really cool, and it worked. But I just I find pen and paper easier and I literally sit there with the same binder and the rule books and whatever supplementary material here on my desk in front of me. Or I, actually, I prefer to prep at a coffee shop. I don't know. I've always done that going back to my teens. I, I like to game prep at coffee shops and I make like physical notes. So, yeah, it's interesting. I actually still use the same binder I used back when we were in, wow. in high school and university. Uh, it's a zip up three ring binder it holds because yeah. it, it can hold my dice my pencils mm-hmm. my and that was my yep. you know if i needed to go role-playing i could grab that one thing and it had all my role-playing stuff except for books um yep. so it was if fan- you see, it was fantastic if, if you see me at a con i've got it it's something that i originally bought when i bought the will builders guidebook for ad and d second edition and it was the book i was going to use to put my homebrew world in and it's the same book like it's the same booklet so yeah so mine's pro- probably a little bit newer than yours but not by much yeah but it holds pencils the other thing is for for business purposes it holds my business cards and it holds my uh, my uh not my hsl sheet i'm saying the wrong word my numbers so that if i do meet up with someone and i want a review copy i can go hey 1.6 million people saw my tweets in the last 30 days yes that's right it's not quite a trapper keeper but very close yeah <laughs> speaking of prospero hall i guess their trapper keeper game is pretty good Oh, God, really? Yep, they have a Trapper Keeper game with three different covers, including the Unicorn. That oh, was wow. all of the, the rage when we were kids. Wow. 
one sheet. That's the word I can never remember. I did. I did catch a review of uh, the uh, um, Top Gun. Uh, Top Gun game. Yes, that. Uh, I think I'll pass on that one. Volleyball included. Yeah, that one sounded <laughs> a little rough. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean, they're jumping on the Top Gun marketing because it's a Top Gun release year, right? The new movie's coming out, but it doesn't. I, I actually that's not true. The 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 they have some interesting mechanics in the flight system from the looks of it. Uh the okay. actual the actual dogfighting, there's mm-hmm. some interesting mechanics in there. Uh they have actually included elevation. Oh, okay. So similar to what happened with that BSG game you ran into at uh, yep, Origins yep. last year, they have done elevation. Uh and there are some uh you know, it's template it's template based, but I, I think the volleyball game actually may have killed it. Um, but it's, mm. and, and it's, it's something you could house rule around probably, but yeah, it, but I, yeah, that was, that was almost our topic for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I might save that for two weeks from now. Right. I know how the house rules and board games don't belong together in my opinion. No, I don't disagree with you, especially knowing there are 5,000 board games coming out. Why would exactly. you want to, why would you want to use one that you had to house rule? Yeah. So yeah, when we we do have that time, that was going to be our topic until Sean reminded me it was an AMA tonight. <laughs> Prize. Yeah, I totally missed that. I, I had actually started prep on the other topic anyway. <laughs> Speaking of which, I don't know how long we've we been at this. Do we need to call it? Or are we going to do a couple more questions? Well, I was waiting to see if a couple more came in. We could have on a couple more minutes because we don't have too too much later on. Um, yeah, we got it. It's a shorter second half yeah. of the show this week. Well, I, I'm. My my stopwatch didn't. I forgot to start start it, but I have been keeping on. I know when we started, so and okay. we haven't had any major glitches this week. So I I see a bunch of people talking about microscope, which is kind of neat. I do own a copy of microscope, so Deanna, if you did want to try it, I do have it. The problem with microscope is that it is uh one hundred percent improv play. So you're putting out cards for different scenes, and then your group as a group go. I wanted to I want to delve into this further. And then you start breaking it down further. And then you go, I want to play out this scene. And you literally just start playing, right? Like there's there, there's no, like your prompts are right there. Uh, there's basically almost no rules. There's just basically a little system about, uh, from what I remember, it's it's like who, who and ending the situation favorably or not. And it's like, okay, you're playing whatever. We're, we're developing a Roman civilization. And we zoom in and we're like, okay, there's this point where the... Caesar decides to go to war and do that. Does the country go to war or not? And someone goes, Oh, that sounds cool. Let's play that out. Okay. Well, you're Caesar, you're the lead general and you're the, the, the priest go right. Like that's literally how improv it is. So I didn't think that would interest Deanna at all. I, to me, it's like playing a protocol game. It's, it seems cool. I don't know. I have it. I read it. I don't know when I'd play it or who I'd play it with. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I hadn't run into that before. I'm just sort of flipping through the... Uh... Like, uh, the, the, the end result is basically a big timeline of index cards, right? right. That, that gives you a whole system, right? Like, it seems really cool for do that and then play the game in the world you've made. But I don't know. Like that, That's a level of improv that I'm only just getting comfortable with now. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> to be there's, honest. A, there's an ex, uh, expansion or a yeah, supplement. Uh, Mc, no, no. Uh, Microscope oh. Explorer. Which uh, is apparently know. tools and strategies to get the most out of your microscope okay. experiences. Fair. So for people who are quite grasping it or, or need a little help yeah. to, to do things. Um, See, I know, I know they did a follow up too called Kingdom, which I don't own. I know like the the designer did a, a follow up game called Kingdom. Oh yes, which yes. I think is for developing a kingdom. And it, there's also something called Follow. So there there are three games: are Microscope, Kingdom, okay. and Follow. See, I don't know follow at all. Yeah, see, Deanna's like, no improv, no pass the stick, right? <laughs> like, I don't think she'd like microscope at all. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe if you never zoomed in that close, if you never got to the role-playing part, she'd probably enjoy the world-building aspects. But when you get to that, let's zoom in and see what happened now. Right. I don't think it would go well. I want to get a copy for the Queen, to be honest. That's that's on my I need to get a copy of that game. I think D would actually enjoy it. It'd be I think it's a great game for getting people used to that style of play. I think it's an awesome intro to that style of world building. Oh, there we go. Kingdom is somewhat different. Uh Jeff's saying it's a little more complicated to play than microscope. Yeah, it seemed interesting. The the fact I never used microscope is part of what made me not grab Kingdom. 
but yeah, for the queen is definitely on my pickup list at some point. That's one of those. Maybe maybe uh, CG Realm will get a copy in someday, and I'll see it on the shelf, and I'll buy it as an impulse, or it's something I'll, I'll bring from uh, something I might be able to get from Origins. Though so they're pretty indie press. Uh, Evil Hat. I don't know if Evil Hat does review copies or not, but it's something. It, it, it's not a high cost. It might be something I pick up. For the drama, I don't know that one. It is a web-based sort of concept of For the Queen. It's, okay, made yeah, with I'm a bunch just of games. looking at it right now. Yeah. I got to admit, everyone I played For the For the Queen with has already you like. By the time you play it once, you reskin it. Someone at the table, when you sit down and four of you play For the Queen, one of you at the end is going to be like, "No, oh, it'd be cool as if we did Star Wars or something." Right. Like every time I played it, every time I see it played, every time I watched an actual play. That comes up at some point where someone's like, oh, what if this was sci-fi or, oh, what if this was this or, oh, what if they were an all-girl band? And <laughs> like, so it's definitely something that seems to be easily reskinned. Yeah, they've got, you know, for for our beloved leader. Yes. And, uh, around the, for the commune, for the promised land. Oh, it's on Roll20. That's interesting. I don't have Roll20. Do you have to pay Roll20 to be able to use it, like, to play? I know I know there is paid versions. I, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know what the limit deal. is. I think I... I think I knew last year after our uh, I sat through yeah. that uh, session at, uh, but it has escaped me at this point. <laughs> this game would be great if it was about cheese. Well, everything's great about cheese. It's just like cheese and bacon. <laughs> what else? What can go wrong? You said the c word. Uh, I'm I'm way behind on some stuff, some podcasts and they're going on about stuff. Can buy for the queen for about eight dollars. Okay, but do you have to? You don't have to buy roll twenty. I'm just thinking that's something we could do over online. That could be interesting because it's a talking game. You're, there's no maps. There's no minis. There's right. no, you know, nothing you need to see except the cards. Right. That'd be something interesting to live stream sometime. Like the three of us could play. We'll, we'll see how D does with making stuff up on the top of her head. Right. right. She's got better at it in medium, so <laughs> she's now a pro. She's no, she's not, no longer saying yes randomly. No, no. I'm the one that did last game. I, I don't know if it, that was on our Gloomhaven live stream the other day where I sat there and I, I had the perfect answer. So we put up, we put up the cards and I'm trying to remember what it was. It was, uh, broom and something broom and job. Right. So D puts down broom and I'm looking at my hand and I see job and I'm like, Oh, perfect. Who uses a broom for the job? It's a janitor. This is perfect. She's totally going to say janitor. And then I put the card down and instead of saying job, I said janitor. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was, that was not good. Oops. Like, Oh no, we fail. <laughs> so it, it's not just Deanna that has brain farts while playing medium. Speaking of medium. No, actually we're going to say it soon in the announcement section. Anyway, I won't bother. Cause that's like literally the next session. Yep. Oh yeah. I said it with authority. I was like, janitor. Cause, <laughs> Cause you knew that's what you wanted to say. Exactly. Yeah. That was what I wanted to say. I, I planned ahead. It was, it was tactics. All righty. I think we're good. Thank you everyone for joining us. It was a great chat tonight. It took a bit to get some of the questions going, but you are literally right now the most full our chat room has ever been without a raid. So actually I think it's the fullest we've ever been even with, with a raid. raid. <laughs> I think even with a raid. So that is awesome. I love seeing everyone out tonight. Thank you very much for your questions. We do this the last Wednesday of every month. So you can come back for our next AMA on the 25th of March. But in between, stop by every Wednesday where we answer your gaming and game night questions. And we're not done yet. 